I have a thing here that says the primary class participated in a car race for 13 weeks. Each child had a car on the track, and the first one to go 100 laps won the race. To take a lap around the track, each one attended Sunday school, arrived on time, brought their Bible, learned the memory verse, and participated in class. To earn extra laps, each one could lead prayer, bring a friend, learn extra, extra memory verses, and read a chapter in their Bible. They raced each other and also raced Grandma. Grandma had a car, but the children only let her have 16 laps. So we have three winners. Third place read 61 chapters. Second place, 25 chapters. First place, 120 chapters. Is Tabitha Koken here? Madison Cox and Thomas Arsenault. Would you all come up here? <laughs> all right. Tabitha, there you are, honey. Madison, there you are. And Thomas, there you are. We're proud of you. Amen. That's a big deal. To learn all these scripture references and do all that, that's good. That's very good. Amen. All right. If you've got your Bible and would like to turn with you to the book of Philippians, chapter number four, please. And stand with me this morning as we read God's Word. Chapter 4, Philippians, and verse 15. The Apostle says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again to my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, add your blessing to the reading of your word, Lord. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The book of Philippians is one of those books in the Bible called a prison epistle. It's called that because the apostle was detained. Uh, kept locked up and wasn't allowed to move about. And so therefore, he was uh, as you, in Rome uh, as uh, called in a prison epistle, uh, locked up in bonds. But even though he was locked up in bonds, the apostle said this. He said, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent to me. He said also that in such ever state I find myself I am instructed therewith to be content. He didn't measure his relationship with God and his riches by how much money he had in his pocket. That wasn't what mattered to him. What mattered to the Apostle Paul was the peace he had in his soul, the power he had with God, and the assurance that he knew that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just a few days ago, a 17-year-old girl died in California. She died from the complications from leukemia. She was covered insurance by a huge insurance company in this country, which we have many. I learned a few years ago by studying a little bit about insurance with Prudential that uh, you may not know this, but insurance companies, they told me at the time, control most of the money in this world. So apparently the bankers are simply a front for the insurance companies. Who knows? But I know this. I know that this young woman was covered by insurance, but they wouldn't pay. And until the very last moment, they demonstrated in front of her home to try to get them to pay. And because of pressure from the public, the insurance company relented and would pay for the necessary surgery or whatever she needed. But it was too late by then. The 17-year-old died. 
Now they're suing the insurance company. Here weekly in a place that I can't name because I don't know exactly where it is, but the wife of the CEO of a huge company in this country goes weekly and she shops. She spends tens of thousands of dollars every single week. She is addicted to spending money by the tens of thousands. I suppose that by the time the year has ended, she will have spent well over a million dollars day in and day out. She spends and she spends and she spends. The fact is that she frequents the places that are so expensive that they ask now for shopping bags that do not have names on them so people won't know that they've been in these very expensive places. And she continues to spend. There's something bad wrong in a country. When a 17-year-old girl dies because she can't get medical coverage and another one on the other end of the country spends tens of thousands of dollars week in and week out. That's what Karl Marx got mad about back in the 1800s when he wrote his Communist Manifesto and said there's a problem that we should be able to live. There ought to be certain things that people should have a right to in a society and one of them should be medical coverage. We, in just a few weeks ago, endured a political campaign where the people in the campaign made it very clear how they stood as it related to medical coverage in this country. There are tens of millions of people in America that do not have one red cent worth of medical coverage in America. That, my friend, there's a problem somewhere. And that problem runs real deep when people can fly in expensive jets on one hand and other people can't even get medical coverage to pay their bills. We're not talking about fur coats. We're not talking about diamond rings. We're not talking about splurging. We're talking about trying to live and survive from paycheck to paycheck. And so my friend, when you look out across the country, you say to yourself, that's bad. But my friend, I want to tell you this morning, it's just getting bad. You're just beginning to see the tip of the iceberg because if what some of these people say, 2009 is going to hold some big surprises. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs. Depending on what economist you read after, it could go as high as 40%. That is mind-boggling that almost half of the population of this country will be out of work. They say that 70% of America's economy is driven by consumer buying. In other words, 70% of this economy has to do with you going out to the store and spending your money. And you haven't been going out to the store and spending your money. And the stores now are reducing prices at an unprecedented level. They're selling at 50 and 60% off just to move the stuff off the shelves. And it's still not working. Something is happening in America that has never happened before. People are losing jobs right and left. Companies are going bankrupt and closing their doors. In Knoxville, Tennessee this past week, I believe every single day had an armed robbery. If not, they missed one day. That's unusual. Bank robberies everywhere you look. Armed robberies, convenience stores. And now they are breaking into homes and kicking the door down and invading your privacy. To me, that's the worst crime in the country. It's a home invasion. Because they've come in on you and they're going to take whatever they have to have. These people that are addicted to drugs will buy drugs. Make no mistake about that. If to the point of selling their children, they will buy drugs. If you do not, if you have ever been a drug addict or are one now, you know what slavery is all about. You understand what it is to be in a situation that you can't control. It's controlling you. Church knows all about that. God knows all about that. The Word of God knows all about that. This is nothing, my friend, that we cover up and stick our head in sand and try to say that it doesn't exist. It exists. There's a problem. There's a big problem. But the Apostle Paul said to the church at Philippi, My God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A lot of people today don't have the money to operate. And so they're going to have to stop operating. And so the church says, Well, now will the church close its doors? Would the people not give? And so simply close up and there will be no church because they can't support it. Well, I want to talk about that this morning because I'm going to talk to you this morning about what matters and what is the reality in your life and my life and what makes all the difference in the world as to whether you get up tomorrow morning and you're breathing 
or so forth and so on. In the book of Philippians, he said that my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. And the apostle Paul was in jail when he said that, but he said, I've got everything I need. I've got everything God wants me to have. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. I'm full. I'm full beyond measure. And so, my friend, when I judge what the apostle said about being locked up in jail, I say to myself, my, my, my. The apostle never considered his plight in life according to what he had. He always considered it according to who Jesus Christ was to him. And that made all the difference in the world. There's some classic passages in the Bible that make a great deal of sense when we study them and read them. For example, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, verses 6-12, through 12, it says this, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. We're living in a time when men and women have not been giving. They don't tithe. They don't give God any part of their income. They've lived in debt, and now the debt has caught up with them. There are people with credit card debt that runs ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. They push forward and push forward the bills, and they're literally living on credit. That credit has caught up with them. And now, my friend, they're forced into bankruptcy. And they wonder, what is it? What can I do? What's the answer to all of this? I will tell you one thing. According to the Word of God, if God is placed where He should be, and that's number one, if God is placed where He should be in your life, and that's number one, then He said, I'll take care of all of these other things according to my riches and glory. That tells me that I don't live by the money that comes into my hand. I live by the riches that are in glory. <coughs> that tells me that if I put God number one in my life, that God will take care of my needs. I don't know what next week holds. I'm told my Sunday school class this morning, I live in an unprecedented time. I've lived 62 years. I've never seen anything like this. Never. It was hard when I was a boy. We didn't have anything back then. But it wasn't like it is now. People literally now are losing everything they've got. They're losing their homes because they can't pay the mortgage. They got into a mortgage that was uh, created, a financial mortgage that was very creative in, in its structure. And banks lend, loaned money to people who didn't qualify. And now, my friend, that whole mess is tumbling down. You can go throughout this town from one subdivision to another and find where they're half finished. They started and they didn't, they built three or four houses and then they didn't build anymore. It's like that everywhere. And you find foreclosure auctions. All you have to do is open your newspaper. Page after page of foreclosure auction. I look at those and I say to myself, how many of those people are people who love the Lord and gave Him His part and tied their income and served God? Are they losing their home? And then I say to myself, it can't be right. If this promise is right in Scripture, and you better believe it's right. If God's Word is true, and you can be sure it's true, then He said, I shall supply all of your need according to my riches in glory. Now notice the Apostle says in 2 Corinthians 9, If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. So the Apostle says there's something to do with sowing. Look what he says in the book of Philippians, chapter number 4. He said this in a remarkable way. He said, when you give, not because I desire a gift. He said, but I desire fruit. Verse 17 of Philippians chapter number 4. That may abound to your account. This is something that we don't pay much attention to. But the scripture says that if you give, God is going to give back to you. That what you have given, that He is going to bless it. And it's going to return to you. And the blessing always means that it returns greater than what you gave. Where God blesses it and gives it back to you. So now my friend, it's not a matter of whether the church can survive. It's a matter of whether you can survive. It's a matter of what we're talking about giving and receiving from the Lord. It almost appears to me like the Almighty has said, I've had enough with the United States of America. I've had enough with France. I've had enough with Spain. I've had enough with England. I've had enough with Germany. I've had enough with the world. And I'll show you who brings the sun up in the morning and puts it to bed at night. 
I'll show you who sends the rain. I'll show you who puts the food on your table. I'll show you what life is really all about. It's not about how much stuff you can pile up around you. That's not your life. The Lord Jesus Christ says, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, but a man's life rises to a much higher plane than the stuff that you can acquire. You'll never find life in stuff. So my friend, if you're trying to make yourself feel better by what you buy and what you accumulate and what you pile up around you, you won't feel better. You'll just get addicted. Like this woman that spends tens of thousands of dollars every week. She can do that because her husband is a multi-millionaire. He's a multi-millionaire because he has risen in the ranks of the financial elite. He has contacts that you don't have. He knows people that you don't know. You see this 17 year old that died out there in California did not have lobbyists in Congress trying to get bills passed that would give them breaks like the huge pharmaceutical countries in this, uh, companies in this country do. The hospitals have lobbyists in Washington. The doctors have lobbyists in Washington. But you don't. The 17 year old girl that died with leukemia had no lobbyist in Congress. But I'll tell you one thing, I've got a God in heaven. I've got a God in heaven and He's just and He's fair. He is just and fair in every way there is. I don't know if you realize it or not, but some of the largest banks in the world have gone belly up. One of the largest insurance companies that insures mortgages was about to go belly up. In plain words, the whole structure of what men hold sacred in this world of affluent materialism was, was crumbling. It had come, it was about to come crumbling down. And so now they have taken the money out of your pocket, taxpayer's pocket, the money that you buy your bread with and your butter with and your milk with and you pay your bills with. And they are propping up multi-millionaires and their corporations and 17-year-old girls dying in California. It's almost as if God is allowing the cover to be pulled back in this country so you can really see enough to make you mad enough to do something about it when it comes time to go to the election bar again. Maybe God wants you to understand that at the hand of man you'll never get justice. But from the hand of God, mercy will feed you. There are many of you right now that are being fed and taken care of that don't deserve it one bit. God in His graciousness and His mercy is taking care of you right now. And you didn't tithe your income. You've not given a dime to Him. And you haven't sown anything into His work and to get the gospel out in a long time. And yet He's a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a long-suffering God. And He, my friend, doesn't treat us according to the way we've treated Him. We turn our back on him he'll never turn his back on us we say no to God God doesn't say no to us he's a good God he gives us my friend above and beyond all that we could ask or think he's been real good to me he's taken care of me I've watched down through the years as God's hand has moved in my life and seen the way he's done things in my life and I marvel sometimes at the goodness of God and the generosity of God and the greatness of God and the graciousness of God this is a time of testing this is a time of trial. This is a time when God says, Now take that dollar bill in your pocket. What can it buy? Well, preacher, I can buy milk with it. I can buy, I can buy eggs with it. I can buy a gallon of gasoline with it. I can buy this and that. I can pay for this. I can pay this light bill. I can pay this over here. I can know oh, you can let me tell you what that dollar is good for. It can't buy you another breath of life. That dollar will not get you one more moment on the face of this earth. That dollar bill could never pay for your sins. That dollar bill could never buy you peace with God. And that dollar bill, there's so many things it cannot buy. As a matter of fact, the greatest marketplace there is, is the one that you can only walk into with grace. 
not money. And I'm talking about the greatest things that God has for His people. He said, leave your money behind. When you walk in here, it's all free. And it's freely given. And so the Bible says, freely we have received. And so freely we give. i tell you what God says to me. He says, now son, I want you to look. And I want you to look very well. I want you to look at the theology that's been preached for the last 30, 40 years in this country. The name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. Rich prosperity crowd. They're groveling right now. They're scared right now. They're running right now because they're living in a time that doesn't meet their theology. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. It doesn't match. These preachers that are preaching that have to deal with people day in and day out who are losing their jobs and losing their homes. And these prosperity preachers are in, are in a pickle, if you like to say, because they don't know how to deal with this. You see, my friend, he know where promised you to name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, but he said, I'll supply your need according to my riches and glory. And my friend, my need is good enough. If God takes care of my need, I'll be happy. Maybe there's some things I don't need. I thought I needed maybe some things. Whatever it is, I'll let God do the judging when it comes to that. Amen? I'll let Him take care of that part. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to sow. I'm going to give. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to live for Him. I'm going to go to His church. I'm going to tithe my income. If my income is $500,000 a year, my friend, He's going to get a pile of money out of me. If it's $5,000 a year, He's still going to get a tenth of whatever comes into my hand. It doesn't matter if I'm a multi-millionaire or if I don't have two nickels to rub together. God's going to get a tenth of what comes into my household. He'll get His t- He'll get His ten percent and He'll bless the ninety that He leaves with me. He'll take the ten I give Him. He'll bless it and return it unto me. It's amazing to me how God does things. And if you don't believe that, my friend, you need to start listening to the voice of God. I'll tell you the most important thing we could be doing right now. And right now is a very important time to be doing it. It's to come before these people who are tuning their TVs and their radios and the internet and they're asking questions. They want to know what's happening in America. They want to know what's happening to their income. They want to know what's happening to all the promises of materialism and and unlimited prosperity that were given to them by the government. The government has failed them. The government has failed them miserably. The politicians are failing us now. They took $700 billion dollars of your money and they handed it to bankers with no strings attached they turned around and started buying foreign banks they will not account for the money that's given i read one place where trillions of dollars are unaccounted for and the banks will not say or not the banks but the government will not say where that money went something is wrong If you want somebody to feed you, you'd better look to the one who puts food on your table. That's not the government. If you want somebody to give you a home, you'd better look to the one who my friend owns the cattle on a thousand hills and not the government. Governments can come crashing down. I know that Mr. Obama has been elected as president. And in January he'll be sworn in. But I'll tell you one thing about this man. I personally believe he's very, very smart. And I believe he understands that if he doesn't get something done about this economy and get it done fast, he won't last long at all. He will be removed from office so fast, it'll make your head swim until somebody can go into the government and get this economy turned around where people can live once again in this country, the government is on shaky ground. Let me tell you about a government that's not voted in and voted out. Let me tell you about one that's going to put food on your table regardless of who's in the White House. Let me tell you who puts clothes on your back. Makes no difference about the Republican or Democrat or whoever's controlling the House or the Senate. Let me tell you about one who will take care of you when the government cannot take care of you. And his name is is Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says, I am persuaded that whatever state I am in, therewith be content. The Apostle told him in Philippi, he said, you have sown, you will reap. The Apostle told him in Corinth, you have sown, you will reap. When I say so, I'm not talking about giving me any money whatsoever. I'm a pastor of a church. This church takes care of me. 
I'm not an evangelist on TV in California asking you to send your tithe to me in California. When you do that, my friend, you have bypassed the local church. And if you need food and you need help, don't even bother to call him in California. For he won't be there. But the local church will. I believe God is purging a lot of these ministries that are not connected with the local church. They're having an extremely difficult time right now, and they should. If a ministry is not out of a local church, it has no business in the ministry. For it is not accountable to a local congregation of believers. I'm accountable to you. I'm your pastor. I don't have a separate bank account where I'm taking offerings in from people and salting money away. If money comes to this preacher, it goes to that secretary and it's deposited right in the church account. And that's the way it ought to be. But these fellows that are on TV asking you to sow your money into them, take that money and they're not accountable to anybody. And my friend, they have enriched themselves so long that God's sick of it. And I would unto God, if anything comes out of this mess we're in right now, I would that He'd purge the airwaves of all these charlatans, finally get rid of them and get them out of there, and let the church of the living God that He gave the commission to to begin with, let it start preaching the gospel the way it's supposed to. Amen. We're the ones that He gave that commission to. I'm going to talk about three th- two things quickly and I'll come to a close. Malachi said in chapter number 3 and verse 8, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. You say, wherein have we robbed thee? Malachi says, God says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Here are the two elements that I want you to think about when it comes to giving. And my friend, they're so important. Number one is gratitude. The apostle said in Romans 1.14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Do you realize what an opportunity that we have to preach? Do you realize the doors that have been opened in the last few months that were closed? Do you realize the people that are seeking, searching, trying to get some answers? And now is the opportunity for us to preach. In gratitude, we should reach out and say, Lord God, you've done so much for me. Let me do something to help them. We have a message for them. There is an answer. You might have come to this church this morning, head over heels in debt. Your house is about to be taken away. You've been handed a pink slip at the job. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow morning. Your bank account's broken. You're you're $20,000 in credit card debt. You're in the worst shape you've ever been in your life. Don't ask God for money. Ask God for a right relationship with Him. Get down on your face and say, God, cleanse my heart. Wash my sins away. I give my life to Thee. And when you get up and walk out of there and out that door today into this world, you'll walk out as a child of God under a covenant of grace. That covenant of grace says, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. That covenant of grace will take care of you when the government can't take care of you. But you see, the problem is that human nature would come to God and say, Well, if I'll just try that, then God will take care of all my bills. It won't work. It has to be from the heart, and it has to be a heart that wants to be right with God. It has to be from a heart that says, I've wasted my life and ruined my life. I bought the lie. I've lived way above my means for years, and now I have nothing left. I've made a fool out of myself every way I possibly could. God, can you help me? That attitude, you can get right with God. And He will make it right. And the opportunity is there to be right. God hasn't forsaken you. You're God of wealth. Balaam, the God of filthy lucre. He forsook you. The God of unlimited prosperity. Well, because you're an American, you think you're guaranteed that for the rest of your life you can spin, spin, spin and never have to worry about the consequences. That God has forsaken you. 
He left you dead. Look where you are now. Look what kind of a mess you're in. But the God that I serve, if He has to, He'll send the ravens. They'll pick up whatever they have to on the way. And they'll feed His elect. They'll feed His people. So gratitude. I want to get that message out. What I just told you, I want to get it out. I want people to hear that the thing they thought life was all about was a big lie. And that their God has forsaken them. And He can't help you. When the Almighty says, don't rain, it doesn't rain. When the Almighty brings a financial empire down, it comes down. When the Almighty closes the door, it stays closed. If He opens it, it stays open. He doeth all things after the counsel of His own will. If I know anything about Him, I know this. He gave them 120 years when Noah started preaching. He's a long-suffering God, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. For 120 years, Noah got out and he preached and he said, It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain, people. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. And they made fun of him and they mocked him and they laughed at him. I'm sure he was the brunt of every joke. Down at the local tavern, they raised the mug and said, This is to Noah, the old fool. But then when the rain came, it started to rain. Well, folks, it has started to rain. It's raining. I have read probably in the last three months upwards of 50 economists from all over the world. I have read of at least 20 economists who told exactly what was going to happen when the housing bubble busted. They said it was going to happen. They said it was going to pull this down and pull that down and pull this down and pull that. And it happened. At least 20 of the smartest minds in the world, economists, said it was going to happen. Nobody listened. Nobody did anything. The House of Representatives did nothing. The Senate did nothing. The President did nothing. And my friend, the economy went belly up. I don't think people realize how bad it is. And yet, he gave a warning. He warned. Nobody listened. Well, he's still warning. And his warning is this. Israel has crossed the border. And they're bombing the Palestinians. Pakistan and India right now are at each other's throat. And there could be a war. There will be a third world war. And out of this third world war will rise the man of sin. And one of the surest things to drive a nation into war is to go back and look at 1929. The stock market crashed. Herbert Hoover's policies died. In 1932, they elected Franklin Delano Roosevelt as the President of the United States. He immediately began to set in motion the New Deal. He changed the monetary system, the banking system in this country by legislation that gave them a freer hand. The government began to take control where it never had before. First thing you know, the, government, the, the economy was rolling, but it still needed some impetus. It needed something to push it on. It needed something to cross the line and, and, really, go, and really go. And do you know what that was? Do you know what really got the economy of the United States heated up? Do you know what got the assembly lines and the plants and the munitions factories going? Do you, it's what Eisenhower called right before he, right before he left office. General Dwight David Eisenhower, five-star general World War II, supreme commander of the Allied forces, said this. He said there exists in this country a military and industrial complex. He called it a complex. He called it a living thing. He said it had a mind. It had a purpose. It had a goal. Well, that complex started under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that military and industrial complex bloomed when America went into World War II. And when America went into World War II, this country was changed forever. After World War II, we began to 
enjoy prosperity like we never had before. Unbelievable prosperity. I'm telling you, folks, kids throw stuff away today I'd love to have had when I was a boy. Unbelievable prosperity. But now, everything has changed. They don't know what to do. They don't know which way to go. They don't know what's going to work. They do not know the answer. But what has always worked in the past? What has worked? What do you think that someone would do to give that push? To get everybody back to work? What would it take? War. War. A world war. A war of survival. Not conquest. World war. And out of that world war will rise the man of sin. The son of perdition. Don't take his mark. Well now how much more do you need? Is there anybody in this house this morning that believes that in 30 days or 60 days somebody's going to come up with a magic bullet and all of a sudden all of our problems are going to go away. And the banks will lend freely and people will go back to their jobs and the money will flow like it did before and housing will do. The realty industry is in a depression right now. How many of you believe that all of a sudden all this is going to change? You don't believe that. You wish for the best. You want to be optimistic. You want to have a positive attitude. I agree with you. I'm all for it. I don't believe in gloom and doom and going around with your head hanging down all day long either. That's even bad for your health. But how many of you in here this morning want to face reality? Something is not working and it's bad. And God is giving you an opportunity. In the midst of all of this, there is that space of repentance, that time to get right. Don't look to the government for the answer. The government will give you a mark. You look to the Lord Jesus Christ for the answer. He'll save your soul. Heed my words. Heed them. Amen. Heed my words. Heed the words of this book. Don't look to the government for your answer. Look to Christ. Amen. He's the answer. In Jesus' name, Lord, I preach what you put on my heart. Thank you for that. And thank you for the blessed hope that we have. God, we're not too good, Lord, to go through hard times. You've allowed your saints to do that before. We're not too good. We're not asking for that. We're not, we're not crazy. We're not asking for hard times. But, Lord, we're saying to Thee, regardless of what times come, You're still the Lord, and You will take care of us. You'll supply our need. That's good enough for me. That's good enough. I'll live by that. I'll trust You in that. I'll live by that. But I know that I need to put you first. I know that I need to give unto thee. Lest you have nothing to break and bless and give back to me. In Jesus' name, bless your people. Speak to them. Make real in their hearts what I preached this morning. In thy name I pray.